Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. On behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Barrett, who is the CEO of Engine Lease Finance. Tom, thanks again for joining us for the purposes of our Aviation Industry Leaders Report 2022. I should say we're recording this five days before Christmas. Um, and Tom, before we get into the meat of the questions, do you want to tell our watchers, most of whom will know a little bit about Engine Lease Finance? Okay, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Erlen Economics. Um, yeah, Engine Lease Finance, we're an independent uh, engine leasing uh, company established uh, over 30 years ago. We're based headquartered in Shannon, Ireland, and um, like to think we're among the leading independent leasing companies in the world, and um, it's a position we've maintained for a number of years now, and it's a position we're determined to maintain. As we... Um, endeavor to come through successfully yet another cyclical downturn um, one of many we've seen in those 30 years and and on that downturn point Tom, we're, we're kind of coming hopefully to a place where we're talking about recovery obviously lots of uncertainty and we've talked to variants and things that are there but can i ask you over the course of the past 12 months in 2021 how did customer performance evolve during that time um it improved, you know, like just acknowledging the middle of 2020, we really didn't know what was happening. Customers didn't know, we didn't know, and generally the world didn't know. Um, there's little doubt we've seen stronger recovery in some regions than others in 2021. And, you know, it's fair to say North America carriers in particular, but many other pockets around the world and Europe maybe a little bit of a stall now five days before Christmas because of Omicron and borders um, being restricted again. But we have seen customers recover um, from the dire straits that were in 2020. Um, I have to say, um, you know, there are still pockets of the, of the world where that recovery has yet to take hold and be established. But, you know, payments have improved. Customers have began to plan, you know, our Parts company INAV in Chicago um, uh, are experiencing good um, sales over the last three, four months as we see customers plan for the MRO work that drives their business. And you know the orders are beginning to come through from the uh, MRO facilities globally. So recovery is certainly underway for um, almost all regions. And uh, Pockets of challenges remain, you know, or we haven't disbanded our uh, crisis team completely, but we certainly have released a lot of the pressure they were under through 2020. And in addition to kind of, as you say, managing that recovery piece, are you seeing more opportunities in the market, right. Tom? And, and, are, and are any of those opportunities maybe different than what was there pre-COVID? Are things opening up that maybe you, you didn't have access to before from an opportunities perspective? Um, yes and no. Um, I'm sorry for giving you that cliche. Um, some opportunities, you know, for example, this year we concluded a previously reported transaction with Pratt & Whitney for five, 25 uh, GTF engines. You know, that's in the scale we would not have done previously, so that is an opportunity. But I would say that was probably something in discussion or beginning to be discussed pre-pandemic. Um, in terms of sale and leaseback activity, which we'd seen very little opportunity, surprisingly, in 2020, and I, I think that was reflective of the crisis being as dire as it was. People didn't have a chance to look around and plan and strategize. Um, we've seen a decent uptick in the last six months in sale and leaseback activity, which is what drives our growth. You know, the, the, uh, the Pratt & Whitney GTF deal being a little bit of an outlier in the way we build our platform. Um, in terms of the um, other opportunities out there, you know, clearly when OEMs such as GE are um, exiting the um, engine leasing space with the sale of their engine leasing business together with their aircraft business to Aircast, um, it does present, we feel, opportunities for the future, though I think it's a little bit early to see say what they will be. And from, from a competitor perspective you mentioned like obviously that GE point being one of the Tom 
But what have you seen? Like we, we look at the probably the, the aircraft side rather than engine, you saw still a bunch of capital attacking the space and probably pre-COVID, uh, sorry, just after COVID, there was probably a lease rate factor bounce that's, that's dissipated or, or would seem to have dissipated. Similar on your side, or what are you seeing from a competition pricing perspective? Correct. You're absolutely right. Um, so we've a lot less competition in our space in terms of numbers. We have really tough um, competitors in the space, all very well capitalized, well funded, well resourced, and anxious to grow. And the consequence of that has been that that bounce you mentioned, um, which, you know, past cycles would have indicated to us that we'd see that bounce persist for 12, maybe even 24 months as the confidence had to come back into the space. That bounce lasted about three months and um, the sale and lease the leaseback activity in 2021 has been the most competitive environment we've ever been in. And frankly, I think uh, some of the economics, the sub 0.5s um, only work if you're doing something racy on your depreciation, um, which is not our modus operandi. And from a customer relationship perspective, and I know we probably chatted a little bit about this 12 months ago, there seems to have been, would you share the view that there has been a deepening of relationship with your customers? As, as, you, as you, you talk to a crisis management, you're in the trenches with them now. And as much as having a customer client relationship, there's, there's a partnership element that's probably, in theory, I would say, going to embed itself into the way you work on a go forward basis. I think so. You know, I, I, like, I suppose with the scale and with the history we have, we like to think we know what it takes to work with customers through a crisis. Um, and we can take some decisions that, you know, maybe others can't, you know, I, I'm thinking for perhaps anyone that would be funded on a secure basis, um, less room for maneuver, um, you know, maybe more onerous um, obligations to shareholders and so on, or indeed a lack of cash flow, which, you know, for, throughout the pandemic, our cash flows have been maintained. So absolutely, we should be more embedded. Um, with our customers as we come out of this. And I think for those customers, and, and many have not survived, so let's just acknowledge that, you know, uh, while we're here and looking forward to a bright future, there are a number of airline customers who are no longer here, but for those that are here and where we've worked well over the last two years, I think that will um, strengthen the longer term relationships with all of us. And, and on the looking at the debt markets, your, your thoughts on where they sit currently. So maybe parking, parking capital markets for a second, but, but thinking maybe on traditional aviation debt market, again, probably retrenched a bit at the outset of COVID, seem to be opening back up. But how are you finding it when you look at the, 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 the traditional aviation debt market? Um, I tend to agree it's opening back up, but I suppose some of that is anecdotal rather than direct uh, experience because as you know, well resource funded um, company with a strong Japanese parent behind us, we aren't as dependent on those markets as others. And the benefit of that to us is we can watch and wait to see um, when we see uh, economics we like in those spaces. For the moment, we think there's a bit more to go. You know, I'm, I have to say I've been pleased and surprised with the um, economics offered um, over the last 12 months because I think it shows the maturity not just of the engine space but also the maturity of how aviation is perceived uh, by those markets. And, and we're, we're likely, or you, I suppose the, the solid expectation is we're heading into a rising interest rate environment. So I think the Fed are signaling you know, two yeah. to three hikes over the next kind of 12 months. From your own business perspective, when, when you see that being forecast, what, what's your outlook on, on whether that's going to be, you know, you know, neutral, net positive? When, when you look at the interest rate environment moving in that way, will it open opportunities up for customers? Or worried about customers surviving? Your thoughts about the, your business as you look at that likely, you know, general rising interest rate environment? Um, look, low interest rates have been good for many in, in the sector. So, you know, I'm not going to say we're looking forward with a relish to it, but we're not frightened by it. And, you know, we've operated in this space for so long with so many different interest rate environments historically, and we've, we don't fear it. We know there's a lag 
you know, let's be clear, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're at the coal face with a customer, you know, it doesn't matter that the interest rates have started to move up, they're still um, stuck in the historic uh, uh, low lease rate factors they've been seeing. And it takes a while for that lag um, to catch up, but um, it does catch up. And I think, you know, again, a well-run leasing company, be it aircraft or engines, who is um, hedged, and finance properly should not fear what is ahead. On the, on the capital market side, Tom, just your thoughts. And again, I appreciate not, not a space you guys have had to play in directly, as you say, with the access to funding that you've had. But, but looking at the wider aviation piece, have you been surprised at how receptive the unsecured debt market has been to aviation? And in a similar fashion, your thoughts on the reopening of ABS, which has probably come back quicker and stronger not the full way yet than anyone thought was probably likely. I agree. I think, um, again, um, you know, sorry to maybe use a lot of reflective comments, but, you know, there is little doubt the way ABS has come back has been surprising. I think surprising to everybody. Now, you know, to the extent, and you're correct, we don't, uh, we're not active in that space presently. Um, To the extent that the ABS has come back though. I think it's come back with a lot of conditionality and it's not for everybody. And, you know, I think what's forgotten when we see the banner headlines about the ABS, um, looking at some of the terms that I believe are out there, they're pretty onerous. Um, so, you know, for the part, the lesser using the ABS structure, I think it's coming with a lot of extra cost and burden. Um, interesting too, that the equity seems to be still um, out of the market. And, you know, that's no surprise. You know, if you're tracking ABSs, the equity is not performing. And, you know, I think there's some odd uh, cases where it is, but, you know, virtually every report I read suggests that the E-notes are not being uh, paid on time. And, you know, why would anybody put money into a market unless they're getting something else in return? Um, On the unsecured, um, where we do have some activity. Um, we're pleased that that activity is still there for us. Um, I would say it's, it's there because of our story and stories like ours. I don't think it's there for those that might have struggled or just about got over the line on, and maybe in our case, an unsecured private placement um, a few years ago. I think they'll struggle to use it, but for somebody like ourselves with the investment grade we hold, I think we'll be okay. And uh, we are pleased that the confidence um, of that market remains um, in the lessors who are uh, well able to uh, sustain themselves in this crisis. And and the private placement piece, I know anecdotally you go back to maybe the the one significant lessor that was having challenges seemed to, to cause some disruption into private placement. Do you, do you do you think that's kind of settled itself now uh, on the private placement side? Yes. Yeah. No, I think I think you know I think we have to be um, you know never take it for granted. But I think aviation is coming through this crisis, and certainly the lesser community is probably coming through this crisis better than people might have anticipated. Now, at the coal face for the airlines, which is on whom we all rely, and let's you know let's remember. Um, lessors are little more than a service provider to the airline industry. Um, the airlines, undoubtedly, with the government support, have come through this crisis in a way that might not have been anticipated, given what they've had to endure. Um, so I think you put that um, that piece together, it's maintained the airlines, and then I think the lessors have benefited. And, and then on the kind of M&A consolidation side, um, obviously, Part of directly touches your world. The aircap piece has has yeah. a has a meaningful yeah. impact. Um, so one curious to, to what kind of impact you see that transaction having on the engine market, and two your broader thoughts. Like probably looking a little bit wider, where we saw aircap and a couple of transactions in Q1. Anecdotally, or we can gossip, right? It looks like we're going to see some transactions in close in Q1 next year. Curious your thoughts. One on aircap and the engine space. And two more broadly, do you just think we're in for a period of, of more aggressive consolidation than maybe we've seen for a long time? I think it would be inevitable we are. 
um, in for a period of more aggressive consolidation. Um, you know, the one thing about many of the people who own the leasing leasing uh, companies is that they will have experienced um, crisis from different angles and not just in the in the lessor space. You know, they may have an interest in the lessor, but their corporate objectives, rather, like we saw with GE, their corporate objectives differed. Now, you know, it's probably the case pre-pandemic GCATs would have been sold anyway. Um, but I think as we've seen, it's probably the shareholders' corporate um, issues that might bring more consolidation about. You know, there are some lessors, I think, who are under more pressure than others, and clearly they will be potential candidates for some more M&A. In the engine space, um, you know, and how it impacts on us directly, I think we have to wait and see what Aircap want to do with engine leasing. You know, clearly we're interested to know what they want to do with engine leasing. And so far, the message is they like what they see. So, you know, credit to the team at GE Engine Leasing um, that that is the outcome to date. But I think we'll, we'll look forward to see what opportunities might spring from it. Um, just to finish that point, other M&A and engine leasing, I think it's relatively limited because there are so few entrants. And clearly there are a number of, you know, I consider them the newer entrants, but have to acknowledge they're probably at this for five, six, seven years now. Um, I think for those ones, they're still in that uh, honeymoon period of growth. And I think it's unlikely there'll be much uh, m and in the engine space. Um, you know, one OEM has determined to exit the engine leasing space. Um, it remains to be seen what the other OEM strategies, how they will evolve. And again, that may be where some more opportunity presents. And linked to that is probably just Investor interest, uh, as you said, um, I, I worked on the deal where you required Tom, but I can't remember what year it was, but six, seven, oh, seven years now? Uh, about that, yeah, dead right, 2014. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that's that's where obviously Japanese capital loves aviation, right? Kind of gem really has, and looks as if that will continue, right? We'll, we'll, yeah. Again, a bit of a hit on the COVID side, but, but coming back, mm -hmm. can I see trends you're seeing on investor interest? So we've seen, say Japanese capital stay sticky. We've seen a lot of private equity cash coming at the space in, in, in lots of different capacities, whether it's new platform, non-traditional lending. Your, your thoughts on investors into the space, and are you seeing any trends post-COVID on either capital entering or capital departing? Yeah, um, I wouldn't have any strong view on that, Joe. I, I, I don't have... Um, any particular insight, you know, there's, there is some new money coming. Um, I think there is, um, you know, some exiting too, but I don't have any strong view on that. And, and from your own perspective, again, that Japanese element of just being sticky, right? Knowing and yeah. being around the space for a very long period of time, presumably that's the vibe you're getting from a shareholder perspective. Oh, without a doubt, you know, Joe, I, I think just to be clear in that space and the Japanese, I think someone like Engineers Finance who's a medium to long-term um, investor in equipment, you know, I, I think we would see ourselves as asset owners and managers rather than um, exclusively financiers, if I can draw that distinction. It suits our parent company, um, MHC, um, because I think they take the long, long-term long strategy. They also like the fact that we maintain profits through cycles. And I think with that in our armory, and um, I hope to say continuing in our armory, um, I think we give them what they need to see, which are good long-term returns, despite operating in a cyclical business. Uh, so. I would have little doubt most of the Japanese investors in aviation remain very strongly behind it, and that's not confined to our parents. I might just acknowledge too, Joe, just a correction, while we did transfer to a leasing company seven years ago, we have been owned by Japanese parents um, since 1996. And, you know, I think, again, that's just our strategy of the long-term investment in the asset suits their criteria for long-term stable returns. 
and uh, she, I suppose our challenge here as a team and the mention is finance to continue to deliver that in the midst of this crisis. Shifting gears slightly, Tom, and looking at our, the ex existential crisis for the world and, and by extension, aviation and its place in it, its climate change and the ESG piece. Can I ask you before we talk to solves and impacts um, over time, as of right now, as an engine lessor, is the climate change agenda impacting in a real way on your business right now? Yes. Um, it's begun to impact and it's been relatively quickly from, you know, everybody would have acknowledged it was coming as, as an impact just for the, for the globe. Um, but I think what's been surprising to us is that over the last, 12 months in the midst of this crisis, you know, when, when many uh, started off in 2020 talking about survival, um, the ESG agenda is coming through loud and clear, largely from the parent, you know, who are a publicly traded company, but also from our customers. You know, it is now frequent um, request, um, depending on the jurisdiction in which they operate, that we begin to get asked questions about what is our plan or strategy. Um, in terms of the role we can play as a service provider, we think it's relatively limited in that we don't build the equipment, we provide the service around the equipment. But our own strategy of investment in the latest technology, by default, means that we're investing in more fuel efficient equipment, which you know is like many of the lessors. Um, our aggressive remarketing of our current equipment means that there's less stuff going to scrap. And you know, ultimately our exit through our parts company means that the used serviceable material can be uh, recycled back into the industry, um, thereby maybe not creating the need for new um, in, uh, metals to be created to support the industry. So um, it is getting more, much more important, I think, on so many levels, Joe, across um, the entire industry. Um, and that, that's interesting, particularly in the investor side, which is we, having these types of conversations, it's coming through a lot. I think the, the yeah. investor element is clearly high up the agenda. What are we doing? What's our strategy and how are we going yeah. about it? Have, have you seen it come through on the debt side yet? Right? And if not, do you, do you think that's just a period of time before, you know, you say if you've got new tech engines versus a, a heavier or, or a CO2 worse piece of machinery, it's going to be more challenging to finance that in the future. Just, just your thoughts around that area. I, I think it will be, um, you know, and that won't be necessarily driven by anything um, that's in a pro being done inappropriately or not consistent with, you know, being a good citizen within the, the less or uh, the relevant less or. I think it's the fact that the financiers and their shareholders are looking for cleaner investments. And as they do so, they are um, forcing the, uh, the financiers to address that. So I think there's little doubt it will have an impact. Um, and uh, I think maybe lead to more innovation about finding other sources, but it will, have, it will impact. And can I ask you, we, we talked, touched a little bit on the OEMs uh, over the course of the conversation. W where do you feel on the engine side, the, the OEM uh, providers sit currently and how have their performance evolved as the crisis has kind of moved from big impact to you know, hopefully what is will be an, uh, an upward curve recovery? Yeah, well, I, I think um, both you know, the narrow body engines would drive the industry, CFMI and Pratt and & Whitney, um, have continued to do what they do best, which is to manufacture the equipment. And I think um, in doing that, they, um, you know, I note that they're both ramping up production to meet the demand. So I think that strategy remains. The role strategy, um, you know, largely wide body equipment, I think has been more challenged. And I think they're a little bit more um, behind the other two in terms of coming out of this. And um, you know, the GE product itself, the wide body product at least, again, will be slower to come out of this. But um, so in terms of what they do well, 
the manufacturing, I see little change except, you know, they'll increase production. You know, we've all read about CSMI increasing production to meet the demand of um, Airbus, you know, the max back in produ uh, production and increasing production will put more pressure on the, um, on the leaf product as well. But um, I think what's more interesting to us in engineering finance is what are the implications for how they approach the lessors. And I think um, clearly the GE sale of their engine lease business um, does present, I feel, opportunity on GE products. Um, now, Safran um, still maintain an interest in SES, so they're a partner with um, Aircap in SES. So, you know, we remain to be seen how that plays out. But I would say that the OEMs, I think, um, will engage in perhaps new ways, maybe not radically new ways, but in new ways with the lesser community um, when they have uh, reduced their, their ownership positions. And you think that's a bit pandemic linked, Tom, like in that they, I think the value of the, the leasing community in you know, keeping the show on the road was, was, was very, very important with the flexibility they were able to provide from a finance perspective. Do, do you get the sense that they, you'll, you'll be better valued from an OEM perspective as to, you know, you could be a very, I suppose, a more worthwhile partner than maybe they gave you credit for in the past? Um, I like to think so. But, you know, I think let's, let's acknowledge the GTF and the LEAF are both going to produce regardless whether we're here to support them or not. Um, but um, I think, uh, again, reflective maybe of our scale, which, which few would share, it does allow us to talk to them um, in ways uh, about larger scale transactions. And that's something we have continued to do. And, and on the equipment side itself, Tom, when, when you're thinking about your investment strategy on the go forward, mm -hmm. obviously your kit is better when we talk to the environmental concerns, but, but if you look and said, this is, you know, if we think about our investment strategy, that the, the types of equipment that you view as the pillars that you'll build on, what are they? Undoubtedly, the LEAP and GTF. Um, they're, they're going to be the pillars. Now, we will... And we've always done, we've invested in regional um, engines we, and wide body engines. And we will continue to do that. We think to have a diverse portfolio, you should spread your risk across the various um, engine types. But again, as an independent, we can, we can and do invest in products from all the manufacturers. And we'll continue to do that for like everybody else in this uh, lesser community, the focus is on the narrow body equipment. And just in closing then, Tom, as we look out after what have been a challenging 21 months that feel a lot longer than that, what, what are your optimism levels like as you look out into 22? As I mentioned, we're coming towards the end of here. We've got a lot of uncertainty with Omicron and wondering how that's going to impact on us. What a general belief that we are. On. We're better than we were a year ago, and here's hoping we'll be an awful lot better in 12 months' time. But with your own optimism levels as you look out over 2022? Um, there's little doubt some of the confidence of two or three months ago has waned with Omicron over the last month or so. However, I think the news, as we sit here five days before Christmas, um, the news, you know, that it is milder, yes, more. Uh, I suppose, uh, contagious. But I think other than the blip of the pressure on the hospital systems, I think it will be a temporary, as you know, I suppose, no, no surprise there, the pandemic should be a temporary situation. And so I think in February, March, we'll be looking at a recovery that's well underway. And um, I think the government restrictions that they're rushing to put in place now, just to pause the the growth of this variant um, will ease. And I think certainly as we look forward to the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, I think we'll be well on the way to recovery across most of the major markets. Well, on that hopeful note that we all echo, and uh, when we come back in 12 months' time to chat about this, Tom, I won't remind you <laughs> if it didn't happen. Well, um, <laughs> but uh, I'd like well, to... 
Uh, yeah, you sure it. can, Joe. You can hold me to that. <laughs> no, I never do. Never do, Tom. Because then people will stop coming back. Um, but I'd like to, again, thank you for your time and insights today on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics and wish you and Engine Lease, and Finance, Engine Lease Finance a very successful 2022. Thanks, Tom.